You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. Axe Church Northwest is located in Vancouver, Washington. We meet each Sunday with two services, one at 9 a.m. and one at 11 a.m. If this is your first time listening, welcome. We hope you enjoy. Want to know more about us? You can check us out online at www.axecamus.org. Okay, here's the sermon. We hope God blesses you through it. Let's look in Judges chapter 6. We're going to look at what's going on is the... uh, Midianites were coming in and raiding the area, and uh, God had told the people of Israel, have no other gods before me. Do not worship foreign gods. But the people of Israel were disobedient, and so we have what happens here in Judges. And it's the Israelites did evil, it says, in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Meridian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hoarders came with their livestock and tents. They were so thick as locusts, they arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. The Israelites cried unto the Lord for help. Let's stop right there for a second. They cried for the Lord for help. I I got to thinking, uh, I don't think they're a whole lot different than a lot of us. When we get into trouble, we try to fix things as best we can. And then when we're at an absolute spot where we can't do anything more, then we call out for God. Now, God wants to be in our lives personally. He wants us to share with him. We always seem to wait to the last minute to do that. When I was in high school, I had to wear glasses. And uh, that was a big no-no when I was growing up because they had all kinds of names for people that wore glasses. And uh, I didn't want to be a part of that. So I would put my glasses, hide them in my room, and then go to school. And uh, being the vain person that I was, I didn't want to be seen with glasses. The problem was that at dinner time, I had better be wearing those glasses. And parents said, you know, we paid good money for those glasses, and we're going to wear them. And uh, I would sometimes forget where I, where I put them. And I would panic, and I'd start looking, and I'd be worried, and I'd fretting, and I don't know what to do. And finally, when I exhausted every bit of my resources, everything I could do, then I would cry out to the Lord, help! Have mercy on me, God, if you only know what will happen if I don't find those glasses. And God was always good to me, and I, and I found, found the glasses. So I got to the dinner table, everything was fine. What I learned about that is, why wait until the end? Why wait until... You're so desperate. Why try to do everything? Why not just ask for God's forgiveness? Because it really was being disobedient. Why don't you ask for God's forgiveness and ask him to help you from the beginning? That's really what God wants us to do. But notice here, the scripture says they got to the point where they were facing starvation. All their resources were being taken. And then they cried out to the Lord. And the Lord is very merciful and very caring. When they cried out, verse 7, to the Lord because of the Midians, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of the slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites. 
in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. That's where we get into trouble. You know, God lets us know what we should do. And then we have the choice to either do it or not do it. And because for a lot of different reasons or because we have a nature that's bent towards doing our own thing, we don't listen, then God judges us. That was the case here. And so the Midianites were coming in and just taking everything. But God heard the cries and he heard his people and God is patient, and he over and over and over again takes care of his people, even when they've been disobedient. So verse 11 says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abzer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress, to hide the grain from the Vinianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of a wine press because most of you probably don't have one in your backyard. So you may make stuff in your tub, but I don't even think that's true anymore. Anyway, you see, it's basically a hole in the ground. Now, this is a ruin, so you can imagine there were walls that came up on the sides. And he was threshing wheat in this wine press. I don't know if you've ever threshed wheat before. Probably not. <laughs> it's not something to eat. They don't even have a course at it anymore. Uh, so, but they had this pitchfork-like thing, and they would grab the wheat, and they would throw it up in the air, and the wind would blow away the chaff and leave the seed below. Now, if you're down in a wine press with walls around it, no wind. Right? You throw up in the air, no wind. So here's how I picture Gideon. He's there because he doesn't want the Midianites to know he's there. We're going to find out more about Gideon and who he was. First of all, we find out that he's from the tribe of Manasseh. His great-grandfather, Ebizer, was the son of Manasseh, who received an inheritance in Canaan, and who headed the clan of the Abzerites, Ab Abzerites, to which Gideon belonged. So that's where he's from, Manasseh. Now, God sees the problem, hears the people of Israel, and decides to rescue them. However, when God does something, he chooses, doesn't have to, but he chooses to use people. He used Moses. Moses was 80 years old when he began his ministry. So you people out there who are past 70, past 65, and you think it's time to retire, uh, let me tell you something. God doesn't give you retirement. He'll use people any age. You know, 80 years old begins his ministry. So don't think that you got to sit out on the sidelines and knit. I wouldn't knit anyway, but God will use you. But God uses the ones that nobody else would think to use. For instance, Moses had a problem. He stammered. He didn't speak well. didn't like being in front of groups and speak because he didn't speak well. And so he tells God, you don't want me, you want my brother Aaron. You, you know, I'm, I'm not an orator, I'm, not, I'm really not qualified to do this. But God chose Moses, even though Moses felt totally unequipped, un, 
qualified to do the work. God knew he could use Moses and did. So the question is, how do we respond to a call from God? I was talking with our young adults, and I was telling them that the Bible is a living, breathing book, and that there are lots of stories in the Bible. We, we oftentimes learn them in children's ministry. We learn about these stories, but I don't feel like we do a really good job at explaining how those stories relate to us. And I'm going to give you an example of that as we go through this story of Gideon. It's not just a story of what happened. It really historically happened. But what is important is what do we learn from that? So the first question is, how do we respond to a call from God? Now let's look at Gideon as an example. I already talked about Moses a little bit. Let's look at Gideon as an example. And he starts out in verse uh, 15. But Lord Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. So in the way things work, I'm the least qualified. My clan's the least qualified. And I'm the least in my clan. You don't want me. You need a Schwarzenegger to take the army and go against the guys. You need somebody strong, somebody powerful, somebody that people can have confidence, not me. What you need is a... You need a Rambo. This guy will take on the whole armies. Doesn't matter how many are coming at him. He'll take them on. He'll put mud on himself and hide and get them. <laughs> you need a Rambo who's going to take care of everything. You see, I'm just a. <laughs> Ever seen Don Knotts? Scared of his own shadow. You don't want me. He, he doesn't exactly bring about confidence. He's going to say, okay, man, we're going to go. He, he doesn't want to go himself. I mean, this guy is scared to death. I'm the least, you know, if you look, get Rambo, don't choose me. I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the guy. I'm not the guy. You know, and oftentimes we feel the same way. God calls us, and we think, I'm really not qualified to do that. I'm really not able. I really don't have what it takes to do that. You want to find somebody who has it together. You want to find somebody who is, you know, spiritual and all this other stuff. You don't want me. But God wants to show his power. He wants to demonstrate his power. And if you choose as a Rambo, people are going to say, well, duh, you had Rambo. He chooses Don Knotts, and they go, oh, that's different. Do you remember David? David was just a boy, maybe eight, ten years old. Here's this Goliath, nine feet tall. Shaq's seven foot. Imagine two feet bigger than Shaq. This guy was big. And here's a little kid. What chance did he have? Goliath laughed at him. Ho, 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 a little kid coming. You coming with sticks and stones? <laughs> Boom. He had a headache, went down. They didn't have a head anymore. You know what David said? The battle is the Lord's. He Went in confidence because God inspired him. God led him. God called him. And if God's on your side, you never have to worry. That's what we need to learn. 
We need to learn not to rely on our own understanding, not to rely on our own abilities, not to think, okay, I've got to have this kind of resume in order for God to use me. Not true. So God calls Gideon. And so Gideon lacks confidence. You know, he's scared to death. He tried to tell the Lord, I'm not the guy. So God begins to work with Gideon to build his confidence. So by building his confidence, we go to verse 25. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord, your God. Here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully, sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on that altar, using the fuel from the wood of the Azurus bull. In other words, tore down Baal, built an altar, and then used the Azurus bull that he cut down to use it as fuel for the altar. Now, he did what God told him to do. Of course, he took 12 people with him, but he, he did what he's told to do. And the next day, the people notice that bell has gone. And they're angry. And they finally figured out that Gideon did it, and they came to his father's house, and they wanted him, they wanted to kill him. Because he tore down the idol. He tore down the Asherah tree. Oh. So sometimes when we do things for the Lord, there is a response that isn't always positive. And he's not the first one, right? Jesus came, and what did they want to do to him? They persecuted him. So when you do things for the Lord... It doesn't always turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. You may find resistance. But God's still in charge. God still will take care of things. Now, I can imagine Gideon concerned about a crowd wanting calling for his death. I mean, that you know, they're out there. Uh, we want him. We want him. And he's in there. Help. <laughs> I imagine. That's my imagination. God... If he calls you, he'll get you to finish what he's called you to do. Even though there's resistance. Even though there's those comes against you. And so his father goes out to respond to those who come. And he says in verse 31, If Baal is truly God, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. Same thing as Elijah basically said. Let God prove that he's God. If he's, if he's a God, let him prove it. So he says, really, are you going to try to defend Baal? Baal, is somebody calling it Baal? Are you going to try and defend that God? Let him defend himself. So Gideon learns God's in charge. God will take care of you should be starting to build some confidence in what God has called him to do. And I think maybe he did gain some confidence. But he still wasn't there yet. In verse 36, it says, Then Gideon said to God, If you're truly going to use me to rescue Israel, as you promised, prove it to me this way. I'll put out a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight, If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. So he's still, you know, he's seeing God works. He's seeing God protected him, but he's still got questions. Still, you know, this is a pretty big thing going against these Midianites, uh, can I just ask you for one more 
sign that that's, that's what you want me to do, that, that you're in charge and that, that I can trust you. And I know that that's what you want me to do. Just, just help me out with this one thing. So God does that. And Gideon comes back the next morning. And when Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowl full of water. And the ground was dry around it. Just as he asked, it was done. So God answered Gideon's question. Do you want me to do this? God says, well, okay, I'll, I'll do I'll show you. But Gideon said, gaining confidence, he's still so unsure of himself. He has one of those Columbo moments, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll ju- just one more, just one more thing. Just one more. Just, just in case I got it wrong and it was natural for due to be on that fleece. Ju- 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 don't get mad at me here. Just, 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 just one more. Just one more. So this time, have that fleece dry and the ground wet. So guess what happened? God answered it. The fleece was dry. The ground was wet. Now you think God has shown him that he takes care of him with the tearing down of idol of Baal. That he made the fleece wet and he made the fleece dry. By now he's got to be full of confidence. By now he's got to know that God's with him and that God's going to take care of him. He's got to know. He's got to have confidence now. Certainly after three things he got to know. <clears throat> he is at the point however that he's still going to obey God. So he calls together the army. 32,000. He gathers 32,000. Now, remember that you look over this valley and there's so many camels, you can't count them. This whole valley is full of the enemy. Maybe 300, 400,000, who knows? A lot. Enough to take all the assets away from Israel. They're in there. And 32 soldiers show up. So Gideon's looking at it. He's looking over. They've got 10 times as many we have at least. I only got 32,000 soldiers. I don't, I don't think that's going to be enough. And here's what the Lord's response is. The Lord said to Gideon, chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors. Are you kidding me? I only got 32,000. They've got hundreds of thousands. Ah, come on. You got to be kidding and the Lord said, no, you got, you got too many. So I want you to tell them. Tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. Well, you know the tribe of Manasseh is out there fast. You can say hello. But 22,000. Two-thirds. Gideon's looking going, Come on, give me a break. This great army I'm supposed to lead isn't so great anymore. But the Lord said to him in verse 4, but the Lord told Gideon, there's still too many. Um, God, maybe maybe I can help you with this. 10,000. Hundreds of thousand. 10 against hundreds of thousand. Can we see a problem here? I know you got too many. 
So here's what I want you to do. Take them down to the water. So when Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. One group put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. In the other group put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths from the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands, and all the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths from the stream. All those who drink from the stream, you're out of here. Now Gideon has 300. Start with 32,000. Now he has less than 1%. This does not build a lot of confidence in a guy. At least he had 32,000. Now he's down to 300. Anybody with any sense at all would say, we're toast. And we don't stand a chance. Just call us Custer because we're in trouble. And so even though God showed him miraculously all these things, Gideon's still thinking, do you really know what you're, you're doing here? Maybe you haven't quite calculated this right. So God, in chapter 7, verse 9, he says, That night the Lord said, Get up, go down to the Midianites' camp, for I have given you victory over them. But if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you'll be greatly encouraged. Then you'll be eager to attack. I'm thinking Gideon's going, uh, that, That's what you say. I like this. If you're still afraid, do you think he went down to the camp? Yeah, he was still afraid. Yeah, he went down to the camp. And so he does. He goes down to the attack. The, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east had settled in the valley like swarm of locusts. Their cam camels like grains of sand up on the seashore. Too many to count. Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. The man said, I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley <clears throat> bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. His companion answered, this is, this is great, because <laughs> God gave this guy the interpretation of the dream. Your dream can mean only one thing. Now, most people say, well, it could mean this, it could mean that. He says, it could only mean one thing. Here's the only thing it could possibly mean. God has given Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelites, victory over Midian and all its allies. They're surrounded with people, all these Midianites, all the other people that are there. He goes, we're toast. And Gideon saying to himself, I know how you feel. <laughs> but here's the thing. The reputation of God being on the side of the Israelites was known. They know that they came into that land. They know that they marched around these walls of Jericho and shouted, and the walls are coming tumbling down. They heard the stories. And they said, if God's going to take them and be on their side, we don't stand a chance. Gideon, finally, the light goes on. Ding. He didn't believe when God did all this stuff. But the enemy says, we're toast. He finally gets it. Oh, takes a mini night to tell me. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know he believed. So God tells him the plan. God tells him 
how this is going to work out. Here's the thing. God doesn't always call the equipped, the talented, the most obvious, but he always equips the one he calls. God doesn't choose the ones we would choose. If we formed a committee to have a leader, we'd be choosing Rambo. God chooses a Don Knotts. But he stands behind him and he's going to show his power through Gideon. And nobody's going to be surprised when they see Don Knotts going, I beat him, I beat him, I did. <laughs> They're going to go, that's the guy who led, that's the guy who took care of us all, that's the guy. So who gets the glory? To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let it be known, and no question about it, it was God, not Gideon. God was the one who delivered him. He used Gideon to prove it was God. You know, in the scripture, it tells us about Jesus. And there was a woman with an issue of blood. For many years, she'd gone to many doctors, and none of them were able to cure her. But she heard about Jesus, how he was a holy man, who could and would kill people. So she went to him, and there's a large crowd surrounding Jesus. She couldn't get to him. But she finally inched her way closer and closer to finally she was able to reach out and touch the little tassels on his prayer cloth that he wore. Those tassels are called wings. And the scripture says there's healing in his wings. And when she reached out and she touched the wings of his garment, she was healed. Here's Jesus' response. Somebody touched me because I felt power being released. I felt power going out from me. Here's what Jesus says in John. The works I do are not mine, but my Father's. You see, Jesus had limited himself to being a human with all the limitations of a human. The miracles that Jesus was doing was God using the human Jesus to perform his power and his works. He was using the human Jesus to teach what God wanted taught. Jesus was the servant, made himself lower than the angels, it tells us, because he was to be an example to us, to let you know that God can use humans and power can come through humans to those who are serving God, to those who are under his direction, to those who are submitted to him, the power of God can come through us just as it came through Jesus. We can feel power coming from us, not our power, not our strength, not our wisdom, not understanding, but God's. And everybody qualifies <laughs> to be used by God. We just have to submit. We just have to be willing to trust and believe. That's our problem. We lack trust and belief. We're no different than Gideon. Uh, uh, just, just one minute. God's calling you to teach junior hires. Uh, ju ju just, just one minute. I'm not any good with junior hires. I don't know anybody who's good with junior hires. You certainly don't want me teaching junior hires. No, Lord. Well, what if I show you that it can be done because I will do it? Well, I'd have to have a lot more than that. I'm going to have to have a sign. In fact, I, I, I need another sign. In fact, I, I need three I need four signs. I need a lot of signs. 
if I'm going to teach junior hires. That's who we are. We don't see how we can accomplish how it's possible so we don't receive the privilege and the honor of allowing God to do the miraculous. Whenever I teach and preach, I always pray, God, you speak to the hearts. You do it. Because I can craft this wonderful sermon in my human strength. And I can deliver it with fantastic (laughs) showmanship. It's all for naught. Unless God, unless it comes from God, unless it's inspired by God. I don't read my sermons. I read the scriptures. I don't read my sermons. Why? I rely on the Lord to lead and to guide. I look for him. I pray while preparing. Lord, give me what you want me to say. Help me to to do what you want me to do. Because I don't want just it to be a sermon. I just want it to be a lecture. I want it to have power that comes from you. And when God moves... It's amazing. I once did a sermon on tithing. And most people, you know, they're... And when they're leaving, they kind of zip by you. And one little gal, 19 or 20, whatever it was, come out with a big smile on her face. I'm going, did you just come out of the same, same one everybody else came out of? And she, and she comes and says, Pastor, Pastor, thank you so much. I accepted Jesus today. And I was stunned. Because I was preaching on giving. And she's accepting the Lord. What? You missed the sub? Wait. I didn't say that, but I mean, in my mind I'm going, I, I was teaching on tithing to the Lord and you got saved. How did that happen? How did it happen? God! She heard the Lord speak to her heart. Doesn't matter what I'm saying. It matters what he is saying. God can use anybody, no matter how inept they think they are. In fact, sometimes I think he uses us better when we feel that we can't do anything. It says Moses was extremely humble. You know what the worst thing is? The worst thing is, Ego gets in the way. With Gideon, you can continue reading the story. He starts taking credit. You can imagine, here's Don Knotts again. You should have been there. The valley was full of them all. And we came in there, we surrounded them, and we took them. They just killed each other. I'm just telling you. It was the sword of Gideon and the Lord. <laughs> Whatever said first, see, is, has the most power to it. It was the Lord, and he used Gideon. No, it was the sword of Gideon. It wasn't the sword of Gideon. But you can start believing that. I had to learn that in the most humbling way. We were in a church in California, a little tiny church. They are supposed to close it. It was down to 15 people. And we came in, and it was 20, our family. We had instant growth. And percentage-wise, that wasn't bad. But that church was in trouble. Why did God send me there? I don't know. I can tell you the circumstances behind it. It was very... Weird how it all happened, but there we were. And God began to do miracles. Now, it was a Quaker church. We weren't used to miracles. We're used to, you know, very quietly and enjoying 
music and everything else. But we, we, weren't, we weren't the dancing in the fuse type people or anything. And we certainly didn't understand what miracles were all about. We understood them in the Bible. We knew that they happened. We even knew that it could be happening around us, but we had not. I had not. And God started doing miracles. And he was using this guy in his first pastorate. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue. I hadn't done that before. God was able to use it. He's able to use my ineptness and not knowing anything about anything to do these miracles. But you know, it didn't take long. It didn't take long before the old eagle come out. You know, he had a guy who fell off the back of a truck, was dying, brought out of a coma, and within three days he was home, totally healed. Had a little kid, junior high age, who was totally deaf, who was healed. We had these miracles. There's going on, and they were happening a lot. They were happening so much that the superintendent was calling me, what happened? What happened this week? You know, I got to thinking. I must be pretty good. I'd bring them on. Let's get them all healed. Let's let's do it. We're having people that weren't even there getting healed. We were just praying for them. So I started thinking I was it. I thought I was big stuff. I didn't, didn't think I meant to do that, but that's what happened. Because God, God was doing miracles, and people said, you got to go see Dave. Go get prayed by Dave. I just believe in all my press clippings. And when I got to that point, God said, it ain't you. He probably didn't say ain't. But he definitely said, it's not you. And uh, the uh, uh, they lady wanted to be prayed for, and I, she was in a wheelchair, and I said, let's go. No problem. We'll have you out of that chair in no time. And I believed it. I really believed it. I'd just go over there, pray for it, she'll come right out of that chair. We'd seen stuff happen that was miraculous. So we went, and we, we started praying for her, and, and nothing. She wasn't moving. So I'm thinking, you know, Give me a little help here, you know. You got to have faith. She said, I believe that God can do it. I believe God can do it. She was right. God could do it. I can't. I have no power to raise anybody out of a wheelchair. I have none. And it was proved to me that day. And so I, I'm, I'm going to say, grab the other side of here. Let's, let's help. <laughs> let's help her out. Come on now. You can do it. Come on. Here we go. And when it didn't happen, I was devastated. God said, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. And from that point on, I didn't pray for anybody that was being healed. In fact, people were dying. I go to the hospital, they're dying. I pray for them, they died. Not you. And it was an embarrassing lesson to learn. Now, things have happened since that time, but for a long time, there was nothing. I mean nothing. Because it's not you. But you let God. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. If you let God have your life and you give it over to him and you trust him and you do what he calls you to do, even if you don't think you can do it and probably will not think you can do it, you'll probably be surprised at what God does. And when you're surprised, you know it's God, right? Wow. Wow, that happened. You know, it wasn't you. That's what it's all about. 
That's what it's all about. Let go, let God, trust in him, and don't you tell God what you can do for him. <laughs> you know, a lot of times you go, okay, Lord, I'll serve you. I'm going to serve you. Sit back and relax. Here we go. Have I got some great ideas? I know we can do this, and I know we can do that. And off we run, and we start going. You don't tell God what to do. He will lead you. He will guide you. He says, in Ephesians 2.10, he says, We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he's already prepared in advance for us to do. God has already prepared in advance what he wants to do. God will do it. And the works of God are not the works of people. People can feed hungry people. They do it all the time. But when God feeds hungry people, he takes a couple of loaves and some fish and feeds 4,000. When God does it, it's God. When you do it, it's you. So don't tell God what you can't. Don't give me your resume. Here's what I'm good at. Just don't ask me to work with junior hires. <laughs> don't send me to the mission field. I'm not any good on the foreign field. You can't tell God. God will lead you. God will guide you. God will direct you. God will call you. And oftentimes you're going, are you sure you got the right person? I've had those moments. Are you sure you want me to do that? Then I know it's God. I once argued in a car for 10 minutes before I realized who I was arguing with. I'd already decided I wasn't going to be able to do that, but God didn't let it rest. Finally, it dawned on me, who are you arguing with? You're not arguing with yourself. Oh, Father, forgive me. Just let God be in charge. Trust him. He's got it all worked out. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. If you'll just allow him. If you'll turn the reins over. If you'll get out of the driver's seat. If you'll just let God be God. Then watch out. Watch out what God can do. Thanks for listening to that Acts Church sermon. We hope God spoke to you through it. We would like to invite you to join us in person on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. for our Sunday service. If you enjoyed this sermon, have questions for us, or simply want to connect with Axe Church more, find us on Facebook under Axe Church Northwest. Send us an email or message, or leave us a rating or recommendation. We appreciate all of you and hope to hear from you.